This would appear to be largely a case of calf dependency, women breast being they're more responsive to certain cries of babies, and what with one thing leading to another, they end up doing most of the care. Fathers seem to be most likely to do caring when they spend a lot of time with the mothers. So, for example, among the Akka, there is very little gender division of labour, so husbands and wives share in a great many tasks. This is perhaps carried to its extreme in the Titi monkey, where the mother breastfeed, feed the, mothers breastfeed the baby and then it's handed over to the father, who does in fact do most of the care. In the case of the Titi monkey, the parents are monogamous and spend their whole time together with their tails entwined. So the man can't get away. This is <laughs>
Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, just bearing in mind, um, I'm from Mankind Initiative, a uh, domestic abuse charity. Bearing in mind what the, the, the kind of subtext of what you were saying. I mean, do you think that there's an anti-male political narrative in, in, in the UK? Is it getting worse? And is it actually affecting the male psychology? I'm just looking at the subtext of what you were saying. I'm just trying to tease I, it out. I, I mean, it's, it's unquestionable. I mean, I'm, you know, we, we, we've had, I don't know how many years of thinking that men have tried to dominate us, and, and I mean, there, there is a really negative portrayal of men, and you, you just need to keep, you know, I, I, so I get quite speechless because, which is why I need to, um, I think there's definitely a negative portrayal of men, absolutely, definitely. I think we've got a very distorted idea of men and what they're all about, and I think this influences so many policies and so many of the ways that we do things, and I think you can't possibly look at questions like male suicide and male depression without looking at this narrative, and it's very interesting because if you look, I mean, one of the things that anthropologists do, which I, I, I didn't do because I couldn't, they look at um, different explanations which societies give for suicide. So they say you can tell a lot about about a society by looking at how they explain suicide. If you go and read the suicide literature, you know why men are killing themselves, they blame it on men. I mean, this is and it's men as was it? Yeah, Jane Powers. I mean, they, these are Michael Shiner and Will Courtney. You know, these are men as well. It's not just women. You know, we're all guilty. Um, but you know. Men are blamed for their own suicide. Now, that is, that is, is seriously, you know, so we live in a society where men are really blamed for an awful lot. And I don't think, you know, unless you actually deal with this, you can't start getting to the heart of what male suicide is all about. Yes. <coughs> any other questions or comments? I'm interested if there are any hegemonic views of them. Well, absolutely, but I just think we are in charge. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I, I, I do, I mean, if you think about, I do actually feel that an awful lot of roles in society, um, you know, that the provider role, and in a way, what I'm saying is that these roles are actually, they're trying to mimic the female reproductive capacity, you know, that is the, the key of society, and the other thing is an awful lot of what men do is about mating, so from where I am, you know, it looks like the society orients around women. And we've kind of done this really clever thing of having society orienting around us, but we're pretending that it orientates around men, and therefore we somehow get even more power for ourselves. And it's deeply destructive. One more point, Glenn. Um, hi, Belinda. Um, it's really refreshing to see, uh, looking through this issue from an anthropo anthropological lens, could you give us a sense of where you think taking that approach could help us in the gender discussion? I mean, maybe give a pat what you, you're already yeah, talking about. Yeah. Well, I do think that we really need to look at how we live our everyday lives. Because if you think about, if we all think about what's important to us, actually, it's not really who's in power. You know, and, and the things that really matter to us, I'm not sure how much all that stuff out there is really influencing things. So if we think about the things, our, our everyday lives, and start focusing on who's got power in that, then we could start correcting some of this focus where we think that men are so in control. And I think that's where you know, we need to start researching that. We need to start researching how we live our everyday lives and, and, and how that's important to us. You know, that, that is really the bread and butter of our existence. How many people really care that much about, you know, their, their position, I, I don't know. But that's where I think the focus needs to go, to our everyday lives, and I think that's where anthropology is really invaluable, because it, it takes us to the private realm, which is actually where women are in control, or perhaps control is a strong word, but in Western society, we've always focused on the public realm, where men do have greater power, when you get to anthropological societies, which is a silly word really, um, what you find is actually the private realm, people know, everybody knows the private realm is where it's at. So there's no issue about the fact that men are the head men or whatever, because everybody, everybody knows that that doesn't really count. You know, in our society we haven't really learned that that's not where it's at. Sorry, 
I just want to thank you again for a fascinating talk and for the point from. And there are more questions, we haven't got time, but maybe we can all catch up in the lunch. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Right, before we go on to the, the next uh, presentation, I'm just going to read, while John's setting up, I'm just going to read a very brief poem by Kanu Bhutani, who's an Indian blogger, contemporary. <laughs> anyway, it says, called Men Are Men. It says, Men are strong. They have body of steel. But what about emotions? Emotions are emotions. They are not strong or weak. They are not different. For men and women, they are not different for the same situation. Still, men can control their emotions more than women. So when a man cries, it should be a very big reason behind it. The pain is very deep. The pain is very sharp. No one can understand. At that time, just step in that man's shoes and see. You will find the answer. Right, thank you for that, uh, Kali Bhutani, for that poem. I'm going to introduce, uh, needs no introduction from me, uh, John Barry, who's research associate, Dr. John Barry, uh, at the Institute of Women's Health, World Free Hospital, UCL. He's a specialist in research and reproductive health. He's the co-founder of the Male Mental Health Research Team with myself and Nick Sutherland. Uh, a colleague I value very highly. He's a co-proposer with me and Luke of the Male Psychology Section of the EPS. Uh, he's going to be reporting on research done with Leah Lemke at the Royal Free Hospital. And I think uh, Clive Fletcher, is that right? <laughs> Goldsmiths at the University of London. On the impact of job satisfaction and relationship quality on health behaviours in men and women. Okay, that's okay, that's right. Okay, so um, uh, so this the focus is about um, health behaviours. So we're talking about um, unhealthy behaviours, really, um, and I guess they're quite important. I suppose it's mostly talked about in the health circles, you know, obesity being a problem and alcoholism being a big problem. Um, this study was was uh, trying to examine whether um, there were any factors in the workplace um, and also factors at home or in relationships, personal relationships with husbands and wives um, that might have an impact on unhealthy and healthy behaviors. So if you've got a bad relationship, will that make you drink more or eat more unhealthy? And the same work, when you're at work, if you have a bad day, do you drink more um, and compensate with eat any more? Things like that. So that, that's the focus of this. Um, I have a, a, I don't know, I suppose some people would say it's a bad habit of uh, looking at things through a gendered lens. Um, you know, I, I have, I don't know, I seem to maybe have some psychological problem myself. I don't see why I shouldn't look at uh, men and women as maybe potentially having uh, different issues or kind of different degrees of issues. And I think it's quite important that we don't get that. So, um, I still do get people who ask, you know, why are we studying gender differences? You know, why, why, why can't you just leave it alone? Basically, you know, if you say we're all the same, you know, we would have that. Okay, so just before I get on to the main part of the presentation, I'll just, I suppose, make a sort of a case or pose or something like that for, for gender-based research. Um, and this is kind of my position, really, which is that, that men and women are the same. But are the same. <coughs> And like uh, taking a kind of like a, a silly example, and um, you know, uh, men don't go to gynecologists. You know, and, you know, obviously in medicine, if there isn't too much difficulty in recognising that men and women have different needs, and we don't use exactly the same treatments for both. Um, and also, um, a lot of us will know that uh, men and women uh, behave differently when it comes to to things like help seeking or kind of various attitudes towards um, uh, their mental health and physical health. And uh, there's, for example, different types of screen and And in medicine, just to take a few examples, I mean, this is a, this is a sort of list of, of uh, sex differences in medicine. But uh, they're just things that, that I've kind of come across that, that I find of interest. So heart attack symptoms uh, tend to be a little bit different in a lot of them. And it's 
for years we didn't know that. We just we just thought, okay, we have a heart attack. Uh, you know, you're short of breath and you've got pain in your chest and maybe you enjoy your arm. But actually women tend to, to get a uh, lot more involved with nausea and vomit. And because they get that sort of symptom, they don't identify what they're experiencing as a heart attack. So then they're putting their lives at risk because they, 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 somebody or me or they didn't go out and do the research and identify differences in men and women in terms of symptoms for heart failure. Um, Incidents of, of disease of uh, women are more prone to things like uh, arthritis and common anxiety. Um, reactions to medication and women uh, can react to different medications. Um, we took the recovery time from surgery and uh, sometimes And uh, one that I came across uh, very recently myself in my own research into the polycystic ovary syndrome, uh, there's a poster uh, um, in the Gavin Bureau room with some more detail. But uh, you know, I'm standing here saying, you know, bad us, we, we should be doing more uh, gender focused research and uh, differentiating between men and women. And for a number of years I've been looking at PCOS. And it's polycystic ovary syndrome, so you know, it is it's a, a weird condition that <laughs> but we were looking at, uh, at the possibility that there was uh, uh, exposure to elevated levels of testosterone prenatally uh, in PCOS pregnancies. So we were concerned that, that a female fetus in a PCOS pregnancy uh, might be exposed to high levels of testosterone or just higher than levels, well, uh, levels of testosterone. Um, and the results can be quite dramatic. If you put a little bit of testosterone in a female fetus, That's fine, it's swimming in the stuff, and it's no problem at all. But for a female fetus, that can be very damaging. So we were concerned about that. Um, but recently, I, I was looking at the findings of some of the research that, that, that we've done over the last couple of years, and uh, where we have looked at the differences between the, the fetus uh, of a, uh, the male fetus in a PCOS pregnancy versus a healthy pregnancy. And very unexpectedly, we found that, that the male fetus pregnancy experiences lower than normal levels of testosterone. That's not what we expected to see at all. So we seem to have kind of a, 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 the opposite of, of what we expected. We thought, well, male fetus will be fine because it's just going to get a little bit extra testosterone. But we'll make no difference at all. In fact, there's lower levels in PCOS pregnancy, um, which is actually fairly dramatic and bad news for uh, you know, uh, PCOS pregnancies. Because of all of the kind of the, the problems that, that we expected to see in girls with PCOS pregnancies, the kind of going on in adult life to, to have problems with fertility, problems with, uh, with uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, cardiovasculars, all of those things then will happen, or we would predict will happen in the boys with PCOS pregnancy. And we didn't know that. In, in, in fact, this finding has a good function, it's, it's in the but we didn't know that because. We just haven't been looking for it. We just didn't look at it. Okay, so, so that's kind of my own kind of life that I'm kind of professing to, to kind of uh, to, to not doing, you know, not kind of doing what I'm preaching to, to, to do. But I think in, in, in psychology we tend to, to do a bit more of ignoring gender differences entirely. So the, there's kind of um, lots of the research into the effect of the therapies. Uh, we'll just take patients and you know patients have this sort of outcome to this sort of therapy without saying well okay well, how did men do it? Did men do better than women or did they have a better or worse outcome than women in this particular type of therapy? That, that tends not to happen at all. And there are lots of sex differences in, in general in psychology. For example, we, we presented here last year with the Benny Coffin City University um, uh, a, a mental analysis of toy choice behaviour. So it's a bit of an old round, really, uh, that, uh, that boys tend to, boys tend to play kind of male type of toys more than female type of toys, and that boys tend to play more than female type of toys. And there's exceptions, and that's fine. I mean, this is descriptive, not prescriptive. Um, but it's just like there's, there's lots of differences like that. Um, and these are going to be speaking uh, tomorrow, I think, about. Uh, um, about 
about um, lots of differences um, that are seen between boys and girls in education. And uh, there's plenty of them. But my own research, uh, because testosterone is implicated in policies and programs in life, women with PCOS tend to have elevated testosterone levels. Um, I, uh, uh, I was interested in, in this gender difference in cognition uh, called 3D mental rotation. And this is a, a subject like men tend to be much better, significantly better at, at mental rotation tasks than women are. Uh, and this seems to be related to testosterone levels. So the higher testosterone level, regardless of whether you're a man or woman, the better you tend to be at this mental rotation task. And I'm just going to, in case any of you haven't come across this type of thing, I thought I'd just do a kind of a quick example. So what we're going to see here is, uh, uh, we're going to see object come over here and, um, and what you've got to do the task is to imagine um, that, that object is being rotated in space like so you're seeing it from a different angle and what you get is kind of four more objects over there on the other side and you have two of those that are the same as the stimulus object on the left two of them are, are, are that object rotated in space and uh, two of the objects are then just totally different well not totally different and, uh, so, I don't know, I mean, I feel like, I'm, will you indulge me by letting me play this? <laughs> yeah. Okay, yes, yeah, so, oh, just thanks. Um, <laughs> so here we go. You've got 15 seconds. I want to ask you for your answers. So, two, two of these are the same. This one, you might start thinking, well, I'm going to be a woman. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's just that it's related to the testosterone. <laughs> so, on to what has this very active So, uh, I'm interested in looking at how they do this. And I, I think, you know, they're quite important. You know, they're, they're kind of behavior in the sense of not what psychology. But I still think that they're quite important. And it's quite important to kind of know what kind of things uh, influence these sorts of behaviors. Because if you know, for example, that, that certain factors in the workplace make your workforce uh, drink too much or kind of not exercise and that, that's probably quite important. You might be able to even do something about that in the workplace, make some adjustments and have a healthy workforce. Okay, so we had to. It's just a, an online survey, and we had um, just over 100 men and nearly 200 women. And we used kind of standardized uh, measures for alcohol use and, and get intention to engage in alcohol behavior. But these there were two main dependent variables that we examined. One was risky alcohol use, and the other was the intention to engage in healthy behavior. Then the factors that we thought might predict the outcomes in alcohol use and behavior were job satisfaction, relationship assessment, and a couple of different types of relationships there. And also um, other health behaviors, or attitudes to health behaviors, um, neuroticism, positive mindset, and aggression. So we kind of basically just took a, a, a Range of variables within these kind of workplace and kind of uh, relationship and other psychological factors and, and throughout the survey. And we analyzed it uh, for any geeks who are interested in sort of that, um, with uh, that concept that I was going to call regression. And the reason I point this in is, is just because uh, it's, it's a kind of like if you are doing exploratory research, and a lot of research in general is exploratory because often people have not done it before, you might be the first person to do it. In which case you, you're going in with that uh, very clear hypothesis, you know, the general research. So this is a kind of exploratory type of that statistical analysis. And in our sample then we found that uh, the educational level was pretty much the same in men and women. Um, but the 
the men were uh, significantly uh, older. Not that much older, really. It's kind of 34 and a half years old versus 29 years old in women. It's a statistically significant difference. But what we have to think about is how much difference would it make to, to drinking being uh, uh, or to intention to engage in other behaviors being older versus younger. It can make some difference, maybe not a huge deal. But one of the big things about this, this is that if you use a real regression type of analysis, you can control for the effects of, of other variables on age. So if you've got a variable that's different in the two groups, such as age here, you can remove any effect of, of that uh, variable from the output. So you can kind of, uh, it doesn't become a confounding variable. So the first uh, thing we looked at was alcohol use. <laughs> and we only found um, that there was one predictor of alcohol use, and this only applied to women. Um, and that was uh, the women who scored higher on neuroticism uh, were more inclined to go in for um, risky alcohol use. And by neuroticism, I always think it's a very old fashioned word, like the Woody Allen type of word, but it, it means that in this context, uh, it just means somebody who's inclined to have feelings and uh, they might feel bad about themselves or feel more guilty, they might feel anxious, they might tend to be more depressed. So that it kind of tends to just have a range of not very happy feelings. And they tend to be linked with the self medication. I mean, uh, you know, that, I guess that's not very surprising for them in a way. Um, and that's just the issue of the um, And then we looked at our other outcome variable, which was um, intention to engage in health she found that there were more significant predictors. Um, and I'll talk about that more. We had um, some, uh, some of the findings were the same for both men and women. So, uh, and this is kind of fairly straightforward. Like people, men and women, we felt that they don't, uh, that, well, we felt that they liked engaging in health behaviors. They were more inclined to say, I, I intend to, to engage in health behaviors. Like, so, and again, people who saw, men and women who saw advantages in engaging in health behaviors. Um, but they said, yeah, I, I can see the advantages and I do intend to engage in health behaviors. So again, that would be very, very kind of, uh, But things got a bit more interesting when we looked at how people felt about pain. So I think this is where it gets a, a bit, so you know, strap on your kind of, you know, your gender neutral sort of. Uh, what seatbelts, I don't know, whatever you thought about it, it gets funny. Um, so men who are uh, more satisfied with their pay said that they tended to engage in health behaviours less. Okay? And that's a significant point. Whereas women did the opposite. Women who were satisfied with their pay said that they intended to engage more in health behaviours. So we have um, a complete mirror image opposite thing in men and women. And also for satisfaction of organizational communication. And organizational communication just refers to um, how much you feel that, uh, that the job that you're in, uh, you know what you're supposed to be doing, like your job, your tasks are being created, and you kind of know where your organization is going, you know what the kind of strategic games are. Um, the, more happy, uh, the less happy you were with organizational communication, if you were not, or not the less likely you were to engage, to want to engage in the opposite of women, although uh, not, not quite statistically significant for women, but we have a trend in the opposite direction in the world. So a bit like pay, men and women seem to be doing different things in relation to satisfaction of aspects of their work. Okay. So this is kind of, I mean, we didn't really expect this. I suppose we were kind of, we were going in a little bit kind of uh, right on, on the hypothesis in the first place. But when we saw these findings, we kind of looked at each other checking the stats with the times and uh, you know really a, a little bit strange. Um, I've made a note here, I'm going to be a little bit quick because we probably need to kind of get lunch. Um, but if if I had not analyzed that data set separately for men and women, uh, especially <coughs> the table for pay, because the, the, the relationships for men were going in one way and the relationships for women were going in the other way, if I had not separate separated that the data, that, that those interesting opposite relationships would be entirely obscured. They would have cancelled each other out. And you would not, you would, you know, 
talk, talk, talk about something entirely different. Um, so, in, in that sort of sense, I mean, you know, even though the, the poems might be kind of strange, uh, well, they're there, and I think they're, 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 they're there to be explained. Uh, the kind of explanations that we can come up with, and uh, Clive Fletcher, Fletcher is a professor of organizational psychology, and he was kind of a little bit stuck on, on trying to explain this, uh, which made me think that, that possibly we're just not doing enough uh, research. Just like you know, I've just gone out and done something, I found something that seems to, to be kind of a, a bit tricky to explain. So, what I would suggest um, to anybody who's interested, and hopefully you can more skilled people in organizational psychology than I am, um, could uh, you know, follow up this and maybe interview people and, uh, in a way that you can tease out the, the reasons for any relationship between uh, you know, uh, various aspects of satisfaction. Uh, and also, you should uh, ask uh, a few more questions. We did, in our survey, didn't ask about people's job title or their rank. Actually, that might be quite interesting to, to know about. Um, and one of the things I think is always good about in research is that you should have in mind practical applications. And what I was foreseeing was uh, there's some way that if people are dissatisfied with some aspect of their work, which seems to be related to them being unhealthy, well, then maybe we should address that, that kind of aspect of the work. Maybe you can change, say, communication or, or change, you know, change something. So, to, just to, to finish up with this up, um, can we improve men's health by improving their satisfaction with organizational communication? Okay, that, that's a good question. So, how might we go about doing this? And, uh, you know, you could, I'd say for a pilot study, it wouldn't cost an awful lot of money. Money is a bit tight, funding is always a bit tight. Uh, time is tight, I'm getting away from the money. Um, so how might we go about uh, testing it? Is a good idea. Well, th there's several ways that you might do it. I mean, th this is one kind of budget example, uh, which I would, this is a joke by the way, I'm not serious. It's not the like same guy I do this. So I'm going to just conclude by saying, uh, we should always be aware that, that the uh, men and women of their bodies are not going to have control differences. And these are not necessarily based on biology. They could be ephemeral, they could be just products of, of the, the culture, they could be just products of a particular body of honor. But I think it's always worth being aware that, that they're not potentially addressing the concern. So, thank you. Exactly the same. Um, and I was hoping you were going to say that you got the answer to this. <laughs> um, there's some magic bolt or something that you use that will make men come and help the study. But I think, uh, I mean, I wish I knew. Every time I do a study with men and women, it's kind of just like this study. It's always more women than men. Sometimes I actually have to struggle with it and probably introduce them with advice because I have to go to kind of men's specific sites, um, which are, you know, full of kind of normal healthy men. But we're saying guys. That's bad to have it's kind of introduced some of the products. But I, I suspect it might be related to um, perhaps help, uh, help seeking behavior. I suspect that men are just kind of less kind of, you know, good at coming forward and saying that they... Um, I was just wondering, is there a study of trying to get male samples and the difference in the response? That would be, a that would be the study to do. Yeah. The, the study except, is back. Except how to get the men to do the studies. <laughs> when you look at all the studies, Look at the degrees of sample difference, and yeah. you make that your data. Okay, well that's true. We we already know the answer to that. But it's so, no, it's worth 
putting it into a study that proves it. Because when you say things like that, yeah. people say, well, where's your hard evidence? Oh, yeah. okay. To just get your multiple linear regression sort of thing working. Yeah. And, and on that. Yeah, no, that's it. It reminds me of Thanks again, John. I thank all our speakers and John for, for his support. And thank you all for your participation. And we're going to break for lunch till two o'clock.